Robert Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. Welcome back to Researcher on a Mission Radio, R-O-A-M. I'm your host, Dr. J, and what we're researchers for? Researcher on a Mission for the Truth. And that is the most accurate description you can give of today's guest, being the executive director of MUFON, an organization founded by the people for the people to get to the bottom of the truth of this secrecy that the government's been perpetuating since at least 1947, if not much, much earlier. And without further ado, let's bring on Mr. Jan Harzan. Mr. Harzan, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Oh, it is always a pleasure to speak to you. And especially leading up to this, as I was telling you off air, I've been meaning to speak to the director of MUFON, especially since Preston Dennett, who we're, we were also speaking on, uh, MUFON researcher, 26 years, going on his 27th year, written 15 books, writing two more, co-hosted my Rome radio essentially for the first year and a half until time conflicts made it so he couldn't. So I got my insight through him, and what he was telling me was essentially that people were starting to, basically since Bob Bigelow got involved, um, people started dying down as far as paying their dues, as far as taking MUFON as seriously as they should be, and more importantly, looking to MUFON as the resource that it's been set up to be. And I was wondering if we can touch on that before we go on to what I was going to mean to ask you from the citizen hearing, but being with MUFON, what is the current status of the membership and basically essentially what Preston was telling me, that people are starting to die off in the sense of not coming to that organization that's set up by the people for the people to get us the truth? Well, actually, uh, in the last year, we've actually grown 500 members. We're up to 3,500 members. That's a 20% growth. Um, so actually, it's going in quite the, the opposite direction. Uh, people are really embracing this whole subject. Uh, I think they like what MUFON is doing and the fact that we're trying to be more open and uh, sharing data and uh, just doing what we can do to help break the code on this thing. Um, so I'm very pleased my, my goal would be to have 50,000 members, and so that's what we're trying to do right now is figure out how we would create that kind of an organization. Of course, with that kind of membership, we could have full-time positions, uh, paid positions for many key spots in our director of research, director of investigations, and different items that would help us to actually work even harder to get to the bottom of the truth. And, and this is exactly why this organization was set up. And I'm glad you mentioned that this is on an increase because this is exactly what it's for. One thing that I've noticed on the increase, which I'm really glad is been increasing because this goes to show that people are still reporting sightings, abductions, and other anomalous activity to move on. I've noticed an increase in sightings over the last decade or two decades versus the decades leading up to that. Now, obviously, everyone knows they got a camera in their pocket. So people are saying, well, that's just because more people are filming. But that's more videos being captured of these anomalous activity. The actual sightings, as you know, is are highly are going up. They're on the increase. Do you know if something is on the verge? I mean, you can only speculate on this, but can you explain why more people are actually submitting their videos to MUFON and more and more people are finally reaching out, breaking their silence and telling their stories of their sightings? Well, I don't know the exact reason, but I imagine some of it has to do with just the whole social media craze as well as the access to the inter internet and, uh, you know, just mobile devices that people have so much more capability to interact and exchange information than we've ever had in the history of, of mankind. Um, the good news is we're getting a lot of, lot of information. Uh, we also have other things in the sky now that we never had before, like these drones. Yes. <laughs> you know, lots of Chinese lanterns and a lot of things that throw a lot of noise into the signal. But there's still a lot of activity out there that we would define as unknown um, and very extraordinary. I'm glad you mentioned drones. That is one of the biggest things that people forget to Think about, not only are these drones get, getting up high up there in number because for the military, obviously putting an unmanned, unmanned aircraft up there that's able to be controlled by someone that's on the ground and you're not putting that person to the risks where they used to face for say dog fights or other missions, you're able to increase the amount of drones and aircrafts in the sky dramatically because you're putting less people at risk and obviously the cost is much cheaper. With that being said, the sizes, the shapes, and dimensions of the drones just in the military alone are, are 
so vast and doing so many different things. And I'm sure you know this recently. I saw this on CBS News of all people, not on YouTube, not on, uh, you know, an underground site. Didn't hear it on Dark Matter or but this is exactly where you'll find truth because you're not going to get it on CNN. But CBS News, World News, showed a military space drone landing. And it said that after two years of space flight, uh, it had landed. And I was thinking, wow, this was up there for two years. Nobody knew about this. And then I remembered Richard Dolan speaking about the space program, the military space program being scrapped in the 80s. And there was an article in the New York Times. But going back to the point that you made, more drones are in the sky, more satellites are in the sky, but still the disks, the balls, the triangles, things that were always anomalous. And then there's even other things in the sky just don't seem to falter. Even NASA's own cameras of ISS, the International Space Station, has caught these anomalous objects flying around. And I was wondering if we could touch on that a little bit, because that is a big thing. When I spoke to Dr. Edgar Mitchell, he said he didn't see anything coming to and from space or in the moon uh, for that matter because that's where in fact where he went but obviously something happened to him in terms of consciousness on his way home to open up and start going down this path and i'm wondering the credibility that nasa employees and astronauts bring to ufology as a whole is nothing but good news for us and good news for the people who actually start to listen what impact have you seen from NASA employees coming out more so in the last decade than the last 50 years combined up to, to this point, st telling their stories and adding credibility to the topic of ufology? Well, I, I've got a couple answers to that. The first is we have a number of members that, that are NASA employees uh, working for NASA and uh, also military folks. Um, but the, the top of NASA itself, uh, Bolden, uh, the director, has come out and said that his whole thrust, uh, NASA's thrust, in the next five years is going to be to try to find how to do warp drive. And we actually have a member who is actually part of NASA working on that exact project where they're trying to determine how to do interstellar flight, how to, how to be able to travel to the stars. What's interesting about that is a number of years ago I had the opportunity to hear Ben Rich, who at the time was the past CEO and, uh, of Lockheed Skunk Works talk, and he actually shared that we had the technology to do that. So it's interesting now that some 20 years later, uh, that, that technology is being bled over into what we call the white world from the black world. Um, I'm excited as one to, to see that and to see this opportunity for us to uh, advance our space program. Um, it's sad for me to see that we've got a space program where we were dependent upon the Russians. I mean, great for them to help us out. But uh, who, who would have thought when they were a kid, at least myself, that we would be at some point in the future dependent upon our, our at that time, our genemy, the Russians, to put us into space. I mean, it, it seems kind of strange to me, but um, I think the reason is because we've got a lot of great technology, but all of it's in the black, and uh, it needs time for that to come out and come to the, uh, the other side so it can be used commercially uh, for everybody's benefit. I'm, that is a very good point that you brought up, and I'm actually glad you mentioned the fact that we've been farming out our uh, – space activities essentially to Russia. That is a blow to the American people and the American psyche, knowing that the United States and NASA was the organization and the country that put the first man on the moon, yet 50 years later, uh, or 40 years later of that activity of going to the moon, and 50 years for after the formation of NASA, we no longer have our own uh, public spacecraft. We were relying on other nations. And I just can't imagine what every American astronaut thought when they have to fly to Russia to take off and fly under their terms. And then you think of what, this is the other topic that I want to touch on that you just mentioned, the black and the white world. A former Navy SEAL who served during the Vietnam War essentially told me the technology we're using out here is what the Black ops and the the high echelon of the military was using 30 years ago. And then, of course, that the military, the traditional military, uh, which you would see as being a, a corporal or even lieutenant, the technology that they would be using 
is obviously not good as the Navy SEALs. And then so you have those two tiers, three tiers, actually. You have the black operations. Then you have the quasi-black operations, um, basically meaning uh, Navy SEALs and private military contractors. And then you actually have the military technology. And then you have our technology. And I was wondering if you can give the listeners out there basically a breakdown of our white world and black world and the gray area in between where we essentially are stuck, be- where we are as ufologists are seeing these technologies that were once told by physicists is impossible to do and they're now being implemented and at a rapid pace and of course philip corso everybody knows that story the day after roswell where he was essentially given a a big budget an unlimited budget to figure out what these alien artifacts can do and what the military applications are and so going back again to us having to go to private resources such as SpaceX and more importantly other countries to take us to space to the International Space Station and to do our other activities up there for our satellites Uh, when are we actually I mean again this is only speculation but when are we actually finally going to pierce that veil of the black ops because it seems that there's no oversight on them when can we can you both give the listeners a breakdown of the different echelons that I gave you of the black world and the white world and what we can do to break that veil? Well, I don't think we're ever going to break the veil of the black ops because I think that's why it's there. It's there to protect us from national security. But I think what, what's going to happen is that the, that the technology that's there is going to get bled over into the white world. In other words, there'll be a transfer of technology. It'll happen very subtly. It'll appear to most people that it was something that we invented. Aha, we invented this new thing. Um, but basically, um, I think it's just not, it's not going to happen, uh, but more along the lines of it'll just one day be there, and we'll have to uh, just kind of say, oh, okay, it's there. I, I really think, I think what's going to happen is that people are going to just come to the conclusion that uh, we always had this opportunity, this possibility, and it just, it just came, it just happened. I very much like the transistor, very much like a lot of the advances in technology. Um, I think uh, a lot of things in the past probably came from other sources, but, you know, I, 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 I'm, I just don't think that you're going to get the black to, to offer up anything uh, that they don't want to offer up. I mean, that's just the way it's set up, unfortunately. I think technology is a double-edged sword. On one hand, we are given access to things that we couldn't have even dreamed of. If you took a time machine and you went back 150 years ago and you told anybody, anybody, any, anywhere in the world, in the most modern industrial parts of the world 150 years ago and said, in a matter of time, I'm going to be able to speak to you from the other side of the planet as if I'm standing right next to you. And while I'm doing this, I could also shop and do everything else that what an iPhone does. And this reminds me of a documentary that I saw in the early 90s where basically it was it was called Above Top Secret. And in there, John Lear and Timothy Good, among other people, were speaking of there was this crash and I... This, this, there was a survivor, and it wasn't one of the, the famous ones. It wasn't Roswell. It wasn't Dulce. I think they were referring to something in South Africa. But point being is they said this extraterrestrial had this crystal that it used its t- it basically looked at, and, and they were inferring that it was using telepathy. And this thing was linking itself to link this object the crystal that it was holding in its hand was linking itself to other ships so it could meet, it could visually see other of its family. And again, these are only stories that we could, we can't get to the sources of. But what I, when I see that documentary now, 20 some years later, I look at that object that he had in his hand, which was pure fantasy 20 some years ago, but now it's an iPhone. And so obviously what was fantasy is now reality. And I'm hoping, like you said, things are bleeding through into our hands for military applications. And it's just a matter of time, I think, before it levels out to where all these alien artifacts that were converted for military operations that they basically ran out of utility and bled into the civilian world so we could finally use them. But the downside is uh, the same technologies that we're using are going to be our enemy because the moment an electro- electromagnetic pulse hits us, that'll shut down electronic banking, shut down your ability to access your email, to call anyone, to do anything. And at the same time, by us plugging in all our information, we're giving it Big Brother an 
a, an easy answer to follow us and do whatever they want with us. And obviously, the, again, that is the double-edged sword. And I wanted to see, do you agree with it? Do you think that the technology is actually helping us in this sense? Do you think we're actually able to make a, a better better society for all of us and actually get better in ufology because of this technology? Or as I've said, do you think it's make, hurting us? Well, I think our dependency on technology is a double-edged sword. I mean, as you mentioned, there's a lot of great things to happen when you properly use technology. I mean, our smartphones are a good example of that. You know, you can shop online. I mean, I went and bought a car this weekend. I mean, I, through the Internet, I was able to find the absolute best price without going down and haggling with the store. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can do today that you could not do 20 years ago. Um, but the double-edged sword is, as you mentioned, is if we have this pulse hit us and it wipes everything out, we're, it's going to be quite worse than even what you, you mentioned, it because the supply chain for food is going to go down. And we're, we're all 24 hours away from there being no food on the shelves at a, at a grocery store because of the way those stores are filled every night by large trucks that come in and fill them up. So uh, just imagine living in a major city with, with no food on the shelves of a store. I mean, after how many days do you think total anarchy will break out? So I think you know, these are things we need to think about as a, as a civilization and, and uh, as individuals, too. I mean, because <laughs> after all, if that happens, it's pretty, pretty much every man for himself. Um, but, you know, I, we, we have to use it smartly, and we need to be thinking what happens if, the what ifs, and then have a, a backup plans in place. I mean, I live in Southern California, I think, as you may, too. And, you know, we have major earthquake uh, set to happen any moment, right? And so <laughs> when that thing cracks, uh, it's going to devastate a large area of Southern California and set us back quite some time. The good news will be that the rest of the Earth, the rest of the planet, will be able to come and help us out, right, just like any other natural disaster. But if the entire planet is knocked out uh, because of electromagnetic pulse, uh, you know, it's really down to every man for himself. And total anarchy is exactly where it's going to be. There's a famous saying called seven days to animal, where it's essentially if you run out of in a natural disaster, like we just said, or worse, a global catastrophe such as an electromagnetic pulse, an EMP was to, is, like you said, shut down our food supply, shut down our communications, mess around with the military, everything. In seven days, you will do anything for your family. Who would not? essentially kill for their child or their wife to feed them. And so the point of right. the notion of seven days to animal is within seven days is not only will it be pure anarchy, people are going to turn to their animal instinct and kill their neighbors for milk or whatever food they can get their hands on. And so it is a scary scenario. And like you said, us living in Southern California doesn't help with the earthquake. And even so, if it is localized, which thank God they are, and and you were around for the Northridge earthquake, I remember the aid took days to arrive, which means that we need to prepare ourselves at least to some extent. But you're right. Anarchy is something we need to worry about. And the electromagnetic pulse is something that people should absolutely worry about because the reliance of the technology I think is worse than the actual technology itself be, being a double-edged sword. I think that, as you mentioned, that is our downfall. Now, with that being said, I'm actually going to switch gears and go on to something that we've brought up for the last few weeks. And this goes back to uh, the citizen. If we could, if we could, before, you, before you go there, could we just go back and uh, regress one minute? Yeah. I mean, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned these uh, drones and you mentioned actually a, a craft that had come back from outer space uh, and landed that was a secret uh, space shuttle that had been up for two years. Yes. That was actually the X-37B uh, robotic spacecraft, which is an Air Force secret uh, mission that was literally up in space. It's an it's a, it's a unmanned space shuttle that was sent up in space for two years for whatever purposes we don't know. But it points up the fact that that plus some of the revelations from Snowden and other folks uh, about uh, a U.S. Space Command that may exist, actually run by the U.S. Navy, uh, tells us that there's a lot going on out there militarily-wise, um, you know, behind the scenes uh, that we, we need to be well aware of. And then on top of that, you've got NASA, who's now trying to get to warp drive, which I think I applaud them fully, and I, I, I'm, hope, I'm, I'm praying that they'll get there quickly. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got all these private space companies, which you mentioned earlier. You know, you've got SpaceX, uh, you, you've got Bigelow Aerospace, you've got uh, 
uh, Virgin Galactic. You've got a whole bunch of these companies out there all striving to be you know, first in space and, and pick out niche markets where they can make a profit. Um, I think what's going to happen, I think this may be what you're leading to for the next session here, is that as we put more and more people in space who are, are not military, are not necessarily um, part of, uh, of an organization like NASA, but they're just, you know, indiv just individuals like you and me who have to have enough money to be able to go up on a spacecraft, uh, eventually they're going to be seeing some extraordinary things. Let's just assume, for instance, that there are bases on the moon. That's, a, that's been postulated by a number of people. Um, including Ingo Swan, who was one of the original remote viewers. Um, if you put just average citizen on the moon and they see structures on the moon, uh, unless you tell them that, that that was built before they got there, um, I think it's going to become pretty apparent that there's other stuff going on here. So I think from a disclosure standpoint, uh, that seems to be a more logical way that things will progress is as we get more as privatized space and more of us get out into space and near Earth orbit as well, as well as on the moon. I'm talking about the next 20, 30 years, of course. Uh, I think this is going to really, and maybe one of the reasons why there's such a push right now to lead over this technology that's in the black world over to the white world so that, that they can quickly close the gap between what is known and what is not known about technology and the ability to travel out there in space. I'm glad you revisited that area because there was more points we could have gone on. And I'm I'm actually, you brought up a few more that I would love to hit on. First, the alien bases on the moon. I've been a fervent believer of that notion for quite some time. You said Ingo Swan was one of the remote viewers who originally mentioned that. But yet, since then, we've had so many other people talk about it. I haven't gotten Edgar Mitchell to say it officially, but I think, I believe he might actually know something about it. But again, I couldn't ever get him to admit that. But other astronauts uh, believe that. I actually had a NASA employee who finally broke her secrecy after 20 some years. And sh she wasn't the lady who was airbrushing stuff off the moon. She basically told a story of the 80s when the discovery was coming back in. Uh, over 100 NASA employees went outside to watch these two disks following it. Uh, so anyhow, point being is she held this through the 80s, 90s, early to all of 2000s until this last year to finally tell her story. And if it wasn't for people, as we were mentioning earlier in NASA, telling us these stories, then there, there wouldn't be that credibility coming from from them. And going to Snowden, I'm really glad you brought him on for another point. I got Senator Gravel, which is what was going to segue us to the next topic of the citizen hearing, who was the highest ranking member of the committee of the citizen hearing, where it, all the listeners remember last year, over 40 military witnesses and other researchers and uh, from seven countries testified over a five day period to five retired members of Congress, one retired senator, and that is Senator Mike Gravel. And these, the transformation over those five days of these people. Uh, from skeptics to believers was phenomenal. But anyhow, Senator Gravel publicly stated on this program that Snowden is a hero. If it's not like, if it wasn't for people such as him, how would we ever know where the government is overstepping their bounds? And now revisiting your other point of private space enterprise, I think you're absolutely right. Once we actually have the ability to afford, if we were in that echelon where we could just afford to drop that money, such as Leonardo DiCaprio and Paris Hilton, who've already purchased their uh, Virgin Galactic tickets, and more private citizens going to space who don't have to sign these military agreements of secrecy, they're going to see stuff, just like you said, especially if the private contractors are able to make uh, moon vacations at some point 30, 40 years down the line or, or Mars settlements or any of those. They're absolutely going to start seeing things. And that's what I'm hoping would happen. But at the same time, Mr. Harzan, I feel that the government is going to censor us. In some way or another, they're going to censor us. And this goes back to something you just said a few moments in the same conversation. The left hand doesn't know the right hand. We're using 150-year-old technology to still go up there whether it be Russia or, or formerly us, using the internal combustion engine to 
for cars, for space travel. And all this obviously is very obsolete technology. But yet when you look at the Blue Room in Wright-Patterson, if only that one organization knew that the other organization served by the same government had the technology, then we wouldn't be using essentially stick and stones. Uh, but anyhow, that was my comment on everything you just said, because those are very important issues. And I do hope that the private citizens in space will actually get us somewhere. And I do hope those citizens can be us up there soon. Now, I'm going to use this point to go to the citizen hearing unless you want to revisit any of these topics. No, that's fine. We'll go right, go ahead right on. Okay. Uh, so again, if, I know you know this because, you, of course, you're the executive director of MUFON. The citizen hearing, to me, was the most important public, public thing that could have been done for ufology. Why? Because you actually had as close as we can get to a congressional hearing. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, the transformation of skeptics to believers was phenomenal. Each day they gave a post testimony interview individually, and each one was going, well, I think something could be out there, but I need more evidence. And each day would get better. Whereas like, okay, something is definitely visiting us to the fifth day, unequivocally, we are being visited by at least one or more species or engaged was the word they used. And B, the government's been hiding it. And so this was done. And Obviously, it didn't receive the press attention we were hoping. CNN wasn't covering it. Fox News wasn't covering it. Fortunately, New York Times wrote a nice little piece, but that's about it. But anyhow, a year and a half later, the DVDs were finally made and delivered. 535 sets to every member of the Senate and the House. And Stephen Bassett came on to speak about this getting out there and facts on Washington.org, which is the site where essentially every person can find who they're, who's in their district and email them or t send a, t a tweet or go through their Facebook and essentially blow up in the social media world of look at these DVDs and watch them. And I got conflicting views. Everybody applauded Mr. Bassett for what he did. Congressman Cook said that he thinks just like him, there are white hats that are still representing the people and are doing their job. And he thinks that somebody out there, if not more than one person, is going to watch these DVDs because it's it was requested of them from their constituents. And they're going to start to realize, hey, wait a minute, just as Snowden has been saying, we've been overstepping our bounds, but this is a, a bigger secret and start to look into it officially. But then we have Senator Gravel who served on the Senate for 12 years, who essentially said he's very happy he went through with it, but he doesn't think much will come out of it because the people who are supposed to be representing the people are not doing their job. They're furthering their own interests. Do you think that with these delivery of the DVDs, we can actually expect some sort of congressional hearing? Or are we essentially going to be, as we have been for every year since MUFON was founded, uh, be stonewalled by the government? Well, let me just start by saying that I, I, I am 100% behind Stephen Bassett and what he's doing uh, with Citizens Disclosure. I think the event he set up was first class. It had uh, an incredible uh, uh, cadre of people who spoke. Um, it, I think it, it did miles of uh, good for this whole field. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> with the uh, uh, controlled press in this country, uh, it doesn't get much, much breadth or depth. Um, we, in fact, recognized Stephen Bassett at our MUFON Symposium in uh, July of this year uh, back in New Jersey uh, with our Ufologist of the Year Award for, for, this, for having put this on and for having done such an outstanding job in this. So my hat's off to Stephen and everything he's accomplished so far. Uh, what's going to happen going forward? Well, I certainly hope that someone in Congress will pick it up and run with it. Uh, what you really need is a champion. You need someone who will, uh, you know, brave the, the forces that be and, and actually make something happen. It's a real challenge, though. I mean, put yourself in, in a senator's shoes or even a congressman's shoes. Uh, you've now got these things on your desk, and you want to call for hearings. Um, you, you basically are putting yourself on the line and your whole career on the line because the first thing that will happen is, is uh, they won't attack with the, the data. They're going to attack the messenger, um, and you're going to get – a big bullseye put on your back and people are going to come after you. Uh, the second thing is, let's say you're successful in getting the information out there and all of a sudden it becomes public knowledge that there's extraterrestrial presence on this planet and that we've been involved with and there's a lot of things going on that, that people have 
heretofore have been totally unaware of, um, all of a sudden the questions are going to start flying from the public about what do we know, when do we know it, you know, what, I think people will be concerned about their own safety. I think we tend to be a fear-based society. Uh, people want to know answers to all these things, and it'll open up a Pandora's box that will be hard to shut once you've got it open. So there's some challenges ahead for making this happen. Uh, my personal opinion is that it probably won't just because of uh, just past history. Uh, you know, if you remember back in 1966, uh, at that time, a young congressman by the name of Gerald Ford, who was out of Michigan, called on hearings to, to, to happen uh, in Congress because of the swamp gas event that had happened uh, up in upstate Michigan. And uh, basically, even though he ran a very first-class kind of a operation, absolutely nothing came out of it. And that, that was when people were very open to the subject. So I am hopeful that something will happen, but I'm not counting uh, on it happening. Uh, again, I think what's really going to be the opener here is that they're just going to start bleeding this stuff over. And eventually, some point down in time, whether it's five years, 10 years, or 20 years, people are going to say, oh, oh of course, there's always been extraterrestrials. Who, who would have thought we were ever alone in the universe? You've got to be crazy about that. And, you know, which is funny because 20 years back, people were saying, oh, we're, we're, we're the only rock in the planet. We're only, we're the only rock in the universe, and there's no life anywhere else. So we're making, we're making progress. It feels slow. It feels painful. We wish it would move faster, but we are making progress. So... I think everyone doing their part is going to help this thing finally just break loose and, and we'll be where we need to be. We are definitely making progress. More and more people are believing. And, and as you said, it, it seems like a very slow and, and long and painful process. Personally, uh, 1984 is when I first became exposed to ufology. And I was following it then in, very intently, thinking that disclosure is right around the corner. Then I figured... By the 50th year anniversary of Roswell, especially with this case closed that came out in 94, or the, the first one, the first inquiry by the Air Force, and then the second one in 97, I figured they have to, they're going to have to disclose, especially with all these inconsistencies and all these people that can testify otherwise as to what, what happened, and uh, especially that notion of the time-traveling uh, mummies or uh, dummies, that, that drop, drop test dummies. How can they have the audacity to offend these? people by saying, oh, well, sorry, your memory is a little slated. Uh, it didn't happen the year you thought it happened. And what you thought was three foot, four foot tall was actually a six foot tall dummy. But uh, just, just so you know, but I thought it was really insulting. But I think uh, I was waiting for disclosure in the 90s. I was waiting for it in the 80s. And I thought it has to happen by the millennium, not because it's going to happen at the midnight, like everyone thought it would uh, with the Y2K virus. Then I figured, okay, we are... 2014. Why hasn't it happened? And then I started to think, I don't think we're ever going to get the day where POTUS is going to stand on that podium and say things, because just as you mentioned, we're going to open a Pandora's box. All the people that have died talking about the secrecy, all those lives that were ruined, families destroyed, threats made, people, we only know of what we know of the people that suffered through this. All these other people and families uh, who still have their loved ones that are just gone, uh, and for whatever reason the governments label them, more than likely they were people who were about to speak on this major topic and didn't. And as you know from whistleblowers that have come forward, they signed these agreements. I, I knew they used to be 10-10 agreements, 10-year fine, 10-year fine, uh, 10-year imprisonment, and $10,000 fine. I'm sure these have ramped up dramatically i don't think the fine is a mere 10,000 anymore and i'm sure the imprisonment has is gone up but as you mentioned i don't feel that i i again stephen bassett i hold him in the utmost regard that is continually why i'm always bringing up the citizen hearing doing everything i can to help him speaking to his witnesses reminding people of the event and pushing forward with the facts on washington.org and everything else involved but as you said, from Gerald Ford and the uh, the top-notch job he did with Stanton Friedman, one of the only people who testified at the real hearings in 69 or 68 and the fake hearings 45 years later, uh, 2013, he also said the same thing. Uh, we're probably going to get nowhere. But as you mentioned, the social media out there, the people believing as at such a high pace, I would hope that someone would finally go up and call BS. Why isn't anybody doing, a, a, we don't need a million man march, but we it wouldn't help getting 10,000 people 
picketing in front of the White House or the Capitol building about this topic. What is it going to take for us to finally get such a big movement? Because we see this online. We, If you ask anybody who was born, I, who anybody who's 21 or younger was born at, or, or was in school in kindergarten after extraterrestrial planets were discovered. When you and I were in school, I, at least I, the way the science teacher I had told us there's no such thing as planets outside of our solar system. Yet, the amount of these people that believe it are not taking action. And so what's it going to take for us to finally get a million man march or a 10,000 man march to Area 51 or the state or the, the White House or our Capitol building to finally push the government? Because I don't think social media is, is, is happening per se that's going to create the government to finally admit this. I wish I knew. I, you know, we we have had marches on Washington in the past. The uh, cause, which was the Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, uh, was a movement about 10, 20 years ago that that uh, did exactly that. Organized marches on uh, Washington. Um, you know, again, it wasn't all overly successful, but it did garner quite a bit of attention in the press because they always love a good protest. Uh, they always have the cameras there, and it always makes the evening news. So, uh, by by virtue of that, you get some publicity to it. Um, I don't really know. I mean, you know, and again, if you march on Washington, I don't know that those are the people who know what's going on. I don't think our average uh, congressman and congresswoman uh, have the detailed knowledge of what's – that's what's scary about this whole thing is that really this is buried deep in a small group of people from the military and intelligence community who are running everything. It's not our elected officials who even know. I, I doubt the president of the United States even knows what's really going on uh, with this whole subject, um, and that's quite scary in my opinion. I'm with you there, and I could even see the reasoning of why the president doesn't know. He's an elected official who's only in office four to eight years maximum, and then essentially can leave right. and talk. So I would see, I could see why the secret government doesn't want him to tell. Him. But that goes back to the biggest fear: Why do we have the secret government that thinks they know what's better? that better bets best for us that they're better than us because they have this knowledge that we're not privy to and yet they can call every shot and have unlimited budgets to run these black operations who's giving them the oversight to do things nobody and that's the problem i think that's what we need to fear the most the fact that our elected officials aren't really the ones in charge and sadly they are not given the clearances to get uh, all this information. I don't even know if I think any president was briefed after uh, Eisenhower. And I think the only reason Nixon knew things because he was vice president. But again, like you said, I don't think the president is, is given this information. And that's a scary, scary thing. What do you think we can tell? I think there's nothing we could say to alleviate the fears. But I guess I could just ask your personal opinion on the black world. What is the what is your biggest fear of a, a government entity that has no oversight, that has the budget and technology to call the shots of everything? Well, I, you just hope, you know, that they're operating uh, for the benefit of humanity, that they're really, I, I believe they believe they're doing it for the right reasons. I mean, uh, let, let's just say that you or I were given the rights to the, these top secrets, uh, you know, way back when, back in the 40s or whenever it all first came about. Uh, what would we have done? Would we have gone immediately to the world and, and told everybody, or would we have said, hey, there's some forces out there that probably don't want to have this technology in their hands? You know, the Hitlers, the, the, the Ayatollahs, the different people. So you say, well, it's better we keep this secret for purposes of national security and develop it privately uh, behind the scenes rather than make it so publicly well known. I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a good question. Um, all you can hope is it's it's for the better betterment of humanity. I, whether it is or not, I have no idea. Uh, I think, however, with now 60 years almost passed, or more, more actually, uh, since 1947 anyway, that it's time for some of this technology to be used peacefully and to be put to use for the betterment of mankind. I mean, if there's in fact the ability to travel interstellar, then we should have these transportation capabilities right here on this planet. Um, being able to travel from, you know, Los Angeles to Hong Kong in a, in a, in a split second or two or however long it takes uh, could have tremendous uh, implications for trade and uh, just the ability to move around this planet. I mean, you could live pretty much anywhere in the world and go to work uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, you could have dinner one place and be halfway across the planet for a, for a nightcap. I mean, it's 
it's extraordinary kind of stuff. That's just well, just on our planet. Then you can talk about off planet and how you can go to different uh, different planets and things. But then the energy systems. I mean, clean uh, energy systems. I mean, many of the wars on this planet. I think people would not argue too much that they're oil-based wars and uh, resource-based wars, which cause uh, countries to go at each other. Uh, if you could eliminate that and put everybody on equal footing, that would be quite extraordinary and would really change not only the technology on the planet and the energy on the planet, but also change the whole humanity, humanity on the planet in terms of how people treat each other. So I see tremendous breakthroughs for uh, bleeding this technology over, and I'm just hopeful that it happens sooner than later, and that's what I'm pushing for with what I'm doing with MUFON and, and with the people I'm working with to, to see that it does happen and happen soon. I hope it happens soon. And the biggest denominator, the one common denominator off everything you just spoke about is money, sadly. And Paul Hellyer, when he was on here last month, essentially said that the oil companies have been sitting on alternative energy sources that don't require fossil fuels or anything else. But the reason why they're not giving it to, them, to us is because they can't profit from them. And as you said, wouldn't it be great for you to be able to get off work and immediately get to your next destination without sitting through all this traffic burning, these noxious fumes from these fossil fuels that are coming out of our earth that shouldn't be removed and, and causing our earth in, in, to go in a further disarray. So that's where I start to get worried that are they doing the right thing for the people or are they doing the right thing for their pockets in the name of national security? Because to me, it seems that's what the excuse always seems to be. This is the name of national security. We're not going to declassify this for the name of national security. But like you said, I am hopeful there are white hats out there. There are good people all around the world. And once we can get along on a better level, if this technology was given to us where we can have free energy, solve our hunger problems and all these other problems, I think people are better than other people think they can be. The, the human spirit, the morality is truly there. I just think that some people are starting to lose sight of that because of what's happening with our government. I'm sure we can go on this for hours and hours. We got a little bit about 15 minutes left. So I wanted to gear, switch gears again. And now let's talk about MUFON and you particularly. First off, let me ask you, I should have probably asked this earlier. What got your interest going in UFOs and essentially what got your path to end up being the executive director of MUFON? Well, it all started when I was a young kid. Uh, my father used to get magazines at home, the True and Argosy were the men's magazines of the day. This was back in the late 50s, early 60s. And one of the articles, I believe it was in the Argosy magazine, was uh, by Donald Keyhole, who at the time was the head of the NICAP organization. So he was talking about, uh, it impressed me, the fact that here was a uh, major in, in the Marine Corps who was talking about the fact that these UFOs were real and they were from extraterrestrial uh, origin. Um, and then it amazed me even more so that the press would poo-poo him, <laughs> a man with his credentials, and, 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 and not really back him up. But uh, it, it struck me as being something true. Plus, on the front page of the newspaper, almost on a regular basis, there was a headline here or there about flying saucers being seen here or there around the United States. And so my brother and I just got interested in it, and we started – deciding we might try to build one of these things because we discussed it and we said, well, must, we, we work on some kind of electromagnetic energy because we, these craft don't have fuel tanks on them, they don't have propellers on them, they don't have jet engines on them, so it must be some kind of a fuel propulsion system. And we decided we would build one of these things. And ultimately what happened was we had one of these craft come and visit us where we were living. So uh, at the age of 10 years old, I came face-to-face -face with one of these craft uh, within 30 feet of it anyway, um, and got to see this extraordinary technology, uh, what do you call it, uh, up, up front and personal, if you would. First hand. That, yeah, very first hand. And that, that just totally uh, changed my entire life. 30 feet is extremely, extremely close. I mean, that, that is a, I, I hope anyone can just assume uh, when you're seeing a craft at that close, it like, can't get better than that. Can you describe in detail what this looked like? Was it a traditional flying saucer such as what Billy Meyer uh, photographed or, or Bob Lazar, or was it a triangular black craft? What, what was it exactly that you saw? It, it was actually a landing craft of some sort. Uh, the craft itself, 
I, I tell people if you took a brick and you blew it up to like four feet by three feet by maybe eight or ten feet long um, and then perfectly smoothed all the edges on it and then painted it a bright orange, metallic uh, orange, uh, and then put landing gear on it. Now, the landing gear, there were four, were corrugated like hose, if you will, almost like a dryer hose. You know how it goes in and out, in and out, in and out. It's kind of got the corrugated to it. And it was cobalt blue with black suction cups on the bottom. So it was a very ornate kind of a craft. I mean, it almost looked like it was a, like painted by a, a, a child of, of, of sorts. I mean, it was incredibly, um, <laughs> incredibly ornate. Bright orange uh, body with uh, these blue landing gear coming off, two on each side, and these black suction cups on the bottom of those. And then there were brown crossbars between the landing gear on each side with a bolt right in the center. So when we first saw this craft, my first reaction was, oh, my God, these things are real, because I was right there in front of my face. It was making a humming noise, too. It was making the noise that a um, telephone transformer would make in the evening. If you ever walk out at nighttime, maybe you're walking your dog or something, and you hear these transformers up on the telephone poles hum making that humming noise. The buzzing, it was yeah. Making that kind of, it was making that kind of a humming noise. Um, and it was 10 feet off the ground, hovering, just frozen in the sky uh, in, my, in our backyard at home in Thousand Oaks, California. So uh, my second thought after saying, oh, my gosh, this thing's real, was this thing looks like it's man-made. And the reason I said that to myself was because of this bolt that was in the center of the crossbar. The crossbars that were connecting the landing gear together uh, was almost like a scissors, if you will, you know, where when the, landing, when the craft would land, you could see that the landing gear would compress, and these scissors would kind of like cushion that, that compression by scissoring uh, together. Um uh, but then as I studied it even more, I noticed that the craft was seamless. There was not a bolt or a rivet or a seam anywhere in the craft itself. In fact, my, the, the next thought that went through my mind was, well, how the heck did these guys get in and out of this thing? Because there's no doors or windows. Um, and I believe in those days, this is 1965, I believe that the, this would almost have been like a ceramic. Uh, it looked metallic, almost ceramic metallic kind of thing because it was shiny. Um, I don't know if we had ceramics back in those days. I don't know if we could have bent metal that way and made it so smooth uh, without a seam in it. I, I just don't know that that technology existed back then. Um, so I can't say that this was from some off-planet or from where, but I can tell you that the technology exists and there's somebody flying it, uh, and uh, I saw it firsthand. So this set me off personally on a journey to figure out how this works, and I, I decided to go to engineering school at UCLA uh, and see if I could figure out a way to back engineer something like this. It didn't take me very long before I realized that our technology was so far, <laughs> so arcane that there was no way we were going to figure it out with the current set of physics and, and engineering that we had. Um, but that said, um, I knew that somewhere, someone would have, would have, with a good research budget, would be able to figure this out. So when I came out of engineering school, I uh, was looking to, to hire on, and I ended up coming uh, hiring on with IBM, because IBM at the time was spending $5 billion a year on basic research. And I figured a company like IBM could, could have the money and its research budget to do this. Now, I was in sales. I was in marketing. I wasn't in research with, with IBM. But um, I did have an opportunity over the course of my 37-year career to talk to a, a number of our senior VPs of research about this subject. And uh, I wish I could say that I made some headway with them and <laughs> got them to go, go focus on it. But, uh, you know, it's just it's going to take a ton of money. To go figure this out. Uh, we need to have the uh, universities and academics uh, as well as the in, you know, industry involved in this and, and working on it if we're ever going to get to where this is currently in the black world, uh, unless the black world starts to bleed this stuff over, which it appears they may be doing right now. And I hope they are essentially for us because this would only be a benefit. I wanted to ask you, going back to what actually happened in, in 1965, do you think that what you were building uh, was the reason that this craft may have come? Or do you think there had been maybe some sort of interaction or some sort of thought in your head prior to uh, that may have been some guiding force for you to think outside the box and and essentially build something that's 
using what technology they use. And obviously for you to think outside of the box in a three-dimensional sort of mind instead of linearly. And as you mentioned Ben Rich earlier, uh, he famously said amongst other things, which I remember you, you famous said one of his quotes. Well, one of the things he said was, correct me if I'm mistaken, was that we have the equations wrong. Uh, we fixed it and we can now travel to uh, the stars or, or we could take ET home, I right. think was the line. Uh, do you think that your your childhood was possibly uh, maybe you had some sort of dream and sort of insight or was there any other guiding force that you could speculate on that got you to build what you were building when this thing came well let me answer this first thing first uh ben rich his comment exactly as i was there when he said this was we, there is an error in the equations i, mean, I think it was plural equations uh and we figured out what it is, and we now have the technology to take ET home. So, so there is an area. And if you know anything about uh, stealth technology, stealth technology is built on uh, Russian mathematicians' equations that the Lockheed Skunk Works took. And by back looking at the equations and back engineering it, they, they were able to build the uh, the the. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's the 117, the stealth fighter. F-117, if you ever look yeah. at that stealth fighter, it's got all these weird angles on it that make it, it make it invisible to radar. Well, the it, the reason they were able to build it that way or knew how to build it that way was because of the equations. So when you're talking about traveling faster than the speed of light, we're talking about, or, or actually, I'd be corrected by the physicists, you can't travel faster than the speed of light, but go faster than light, um, travel interstellar, there's a set of equations. I believe it's the Maxwell's equations of electromagnetic energy, uh, electromagnetic theory, but I'm not 100% certain because he wouldn't tell us. He, Ben Rich, would not tell us what the equations were because I asked that question specifically. But I think there's something in there that if, if it changes like a constant or something, that we then would know how to do this. And I think the Lockheed Skunk Works guys figured that out, and uh, that's how they were able to accomplish it. Now, um, leaping uh, to, your, to your other question, do I think there was something that we were being led on uh, with regard to this craft? I think it was two things. One was we had uh, decided to build – this craft, and for some reason in our minds, and we now remember I was 10, my son, my, my, my brother was 9, uh, was going to be a 30-foot craft in our backyard with three pulsed electromagnetic engines. That's what we had designed on paper. Uh, how we came up with that, I have no idea. It just came, kind of came to us as, as something we should do. And so we were thinking about getting the, 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 the cabling and, you know, building these electromagnets and then pulsing these motors. Um, in the middle of all this stuff, my mother went to the store, and she asked if we want to go. We went there, and it was Thrifty Drug, and there was a, a magazine rack. And in that magazine rack, there was a magazine called, uh, I think it was called the Flying Saucer Review. It was a, it was an English magazine at the time, uh, publication. And we bought that. It's a little half-size magazine. And took it home, and as we were reading it, it said in the thing, uh, these flying saucers are seen around military installations, nuclear power plants, and places where uh, anti-gravity research is being done. And I remember looking at my brother and said, well, heck, we're doing anti-gravity research. Maybe one will come visit us. And literally within 30 days, this thing showed up. So there's maybe a consciousness aspect to this. I don't know for a fact. All I know is what we did and what happened. Uh, there might be a fact that we were trying to do something that it wanted to come and check out. I have really no idea what the, what the impetus behind it was. All I know was this thing showed up. <laughs> We are absolutely glad that you were on the path at building that and had such a brilliant mind uh, that actually fell into our favor in ufology. Had you not had this experience and, and the open mind, then we wouldn't have such a good white hat in the position of where you are. So with, for that, with that being said, I got to thank you for going down the path you did and, and studying mechanical engineering and having that open mind to get to where you are. Now, we got just a few minutes left. So I'm going to double this question with something that was just received to me via chat with uh, the question that I'm going to ask. The question received for me is, is here. Basically, I'll, let me read it. It's, it's Dr. Jonathan Reed, uh, his case. Uh, do you recall this case where he essentially had a body uh, uh, that he, there a video circulated that he claimed he found a dead ET or he killed it? The question is, what is MUFON's position on the Jonathan Reed case? And then my follow-up question is, in the time that you've been executive director, what have been the top three cases in in your that you've seen, and also what are the top cases 
in MUFON's history. Uh, if you don't mind asking that, I'll combine. Just want to squeeze it in before minutes. the show. Exactly. That's about 20 minutes worth of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, specifically on the Jonathan Reed case, uh, I believe it's a total fabrication and hoax. I mean, that's my personal opinion. I, I was intimately involved back in 2001 when he brought that forward. Um, wanted to speak at our uh, MUFON symposium at the time in Irvine, California. We had a number of investigators look into it. Um, it, it, it was just, a, in our opinion, a, a story, and it's nothing more than a story, unfortunately. Uh, I think he also said that, that the alien had shot his dog and vaporized it. I think that was part of the story as well, if I'm, if I'm remembering the right story here. So, unfortunately, I, you know, I wish some of these things were more true, but we, we, we seem every about five years we get some crazy – uh, story about something like this that, that comes out. Um, I could probably name several of them, but they're not worth talking about. But I think it's just people making things up, or it might be intelligence community trying to put uh, disinformation into the system. I really don't know, uh, but I, I would don't give that one much credence, unfortunately. Well, I'm glad now, you uh, mentioned that because the, the CIA, I wouldn't be surprised if they are purposely giving us disinformation. So I just wanted to throw that topic. But yeah, let's go up to the, we only got a couple minutes left, so I, I might as well make it more brief, the question I asked you. What are the top few cases that you've seen, uh, just briefly, that, that you've seen since you've been uh, essentially executive director or since your involvement in MUFON started? Well, I think there's those that are well known, and then there's those that no one knows. And so... Uh, the ones that are well known, I, I, I think Travis Walton is just a fabulous case. I mean, here's a guy with seven witnesses, including himself, who saw a craft very close up, probably closer than I, I saw mine, uh, and then he was taken, and then he had his experiences, which he's passed many lie detector tests on. And I don't know how much more information you, anyone would want than that, frankly. Uh, you've got the Betty and Barney Hill case, which has been quite a bit of, uh, uh, of uh, investigation on. Uh, Kathleen Martin is our director of experience and research. Uh, we used to call it abduction research at, at MUFON, and uh, she's the niece of Betty from Betty and Barney Hill, and spent extensive time with her and, and re researching that whole case, as well as working with other experiencers, helping them through what they've gone through. Um, so there's a number of these very high-profile cases that, frankly, are, are very, very good. Now, the ones you're not hearing so much of, uh, and I will mention this, is the our TV show, uh, Hangar One, which is produced by Gogo -Go Lucky Productions and Paul Villadola, who's an outstanding producer, uh, will be coming out with season two, and we've put the whole season two based on actual cases right out of our files uh, that have never been heard before. So you're going to start seeing uh, show after show after show, show after show after show of uh, cases that, that are extraordinary. So I would just keep your eyes glued to the TV set, History 2, in January, and you're going to see a lot of really good cases. But let me just talk about two well, uh, very specific. Mr. Harzan, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I guess with that final time, we did run out of time. So I wanted to give you this last uh, 30 seconds, essentially, to not only thank you, tell everyone to go to MUFON.com, but if you had one final message to give all the listeners uh, in the next 20 seconds, what would you have to say to everybody? Well, my, my comment to everybody would be, look, we're all in this together. Uh, we need to work together to, to make this happen. Uh, MUFON is a, is a 501c nonprofit. If you can see it clear to uh, buy a membership and help support us, we would really appreciate that. If you want to get actively involved, we'd be even more appreciative. Uh, so please reach out to us. You can get me at exe.dir at MUFON.com or just go to our website and go to the contact page. That's right. MUFON.com, everybody. Join us again next week for Kathleen Martin right here on Dark Matter. Thanks to Art Bell and Keith Rowland. This is Dr. J signing off. Hey, Mr. Mr. Harzan, sorry about that interruption near the end and for going yeah, all over yeah. the place. There was just so much important information uh, to, to ask you and speak to you. That's why I uh, we were talking about all those topics. So I know we could have gone on for hundreds of hundreds of hours. I wanted to ask you if it's okay with you, uh, if I could have you on the other network sometime, uh, as well as doing a follow-up on this one in a few months. 
Absolutely. Anytime, John. All right. Thanks yeah. again, Mr. Harzan. If you need anything at all, uh, you have my cell phone number. Call me for anything, um, anytime. And I have a, my family has a restaurant in the city of San Fernando. I'd love to take you there sometime if you're out here. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. You, are, yeah. You're in Orange County, right? I'm down in Newport Beach, Costa Mesa area. And um, actually, my uh, I grew up out in Thousand Oaks, so it's halfway between. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I know. When you were mentioning the Thousand Oaks, I was like, ah, yeah, I was hoping that you might have still uh, link here. But anyhow, if you ever do make it here, um, what does he say? I will definitely do that. I've got one more question, guys. Oh, go ahead, Johnny. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, Jan, what it, what it is, a couple of years ago, I had posted a, a link on the MUFON page. But since that, I've actually found updates and stuff, and there was a video I wanted to, to bring towards it. Um, is it possible to, to re-upload to MUFON, or do I have to use a previous case number, or how does that work to, to update Well, if you, send, if you send it to me, I will years? give it to our guys. You're saying you actually had a case that you reported, right? Yeah, and it's interesting, because you were basically talking about it tonight, which is these un, unmanned aerial drone vehicles, you know? Um, yeah. It was... What had happened was is that I, I was driving home one night uh, with, with some friends and my children, and I noticed these orbs, typical sort of like lantern-type orbs, but not lanterns at all. And uh, I spoke to my mate about it. He was having nothing to do with it, so I ignored it and carried on driving. And then half a mile down the road, I saw a pillar of orbs, which I can only explain or what I would call a Libani, you know, um, a, a, a collation of orbs making a pillow up about 400 feet into the sky. Well, I reported it as uh, A21 M25 orbs. That was the, 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 the actual search that you do for it. And what I've yeah. you know, since, since found is that where these UFOs had appeared and over this base where this Obani just stood there for like, you know, 10 minutes that I was sort of watching it as I started to see it and drove past it, um, this place is a place in England where they do, uh, the military makes drones. It's where they use all of the technology for um, virtual, you know, they, they do simulations, all virtual world, all for, you know, you know the iris bit that, that the Apache gunship helicopter uses, where he has that patch on his eye and it's all computer generated. Well, they make all of this stuff at this place. And uh, so oh, I wanted okay. to update it. So you, you found the source of your UFOs, <laughs> right? Well, I, I found the reason, I believe, why they were there, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you, I want you to send me, send me an email, and I'll give it to our guys, and they'll update your case. Yeah, we're, be great. we're looking at re revamping our things so that you can actually go in as a witness and, and, and update your own cases. But right now, the system doesn't allow you to do that. Once you put it in, you push the button, it's gone. And it's not gone. It goes into the database, but you can't update you, you can, can it. We can update it.